Allah 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 الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا ومولانا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقتة من لساني يفقه قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا يا الله يا رب العالمين رب يسر ولا تعسر وتم من خير وبك نستعين يا فتى يا الله يا رب العالمين سبحان ربنا رب العزة عما يسفون وسلام على المرسلين الحمد لله رب العالمين مولانا شيخ قاري أكرم brothers and elders Brothers of Slack Creek Masjid, Brisbane, Australia. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum All praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah has given us bounties that man can never fathom. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is the gifter and we are those who have been gifted. From the many gifts that Allah Ta'ala has given us, Allah warns us that if we try and count the bounties of Allah, وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُوهَا Allah Ta'ala says if you try and count the bounties of Allah, Allah says it's impossible to count those bounties. The biggest bounty that you and I have is that Allah Ta'ala has given us iman, something that doesn't come with lineage, something that doesn't come with status, something that does not come with age or with wisdom, or any materialistic good cannot buy or compensate for Iman. Allah Ta'ala, after explaining in the Qur'an three types of people, when Allah Ta'ala starts Surah Baqarah, He speaks about the person that is white outside and the person that is white inside. Allah then describes the person who there is darkness outside and there is darkness inside. And then Allah speaks about the person who carries himself as there is whiteness outside but Allah Ta'ala says there's only but blackness inside. Allah speaks about the first category, about the person who has iman. The second category upon that person who has disbelief. And the third person is the person that is hypocrisy. His heart says something and his actions does another. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from the first category. And that is from those persons who are white outside and white inside. The person who has iman. After explaining the person who has iman... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it very clear. Allah says that it is only that they have been guided from Allah. The word Allah uses is hudan. There's many words in the Arabic language. It's very vast compared to the English language. Like in English, we have a very, very, very uh, limited amount of vocab. But in the Arabic language, you will find, like for example, the word nadara, the word ara, the word, the, the word basara, all means sight. All means sight. To use the word guidance, Allah Ta'ala could have used the word irshad. The word irshad. And there's many other words in the Arabic language. But Allah Ta'ala chose to use the word hidayah. The word hudan. And the same root letter words in, in the Arabic language, everything falls under root letter words. The word hudan is also the same word as hadiyah. We, we know the word hadiyah as gift. And therefore Allah Ta'ala chose the word from all the words that could be translated as guidance. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose the word hudan, hidayah, hadiyah, a gift. So Allah ta'ala says that this is a gift that is only selected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah ta'ala says that this gift, Allah ta'ala says whoever Allah has chosen to give this gift, وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ They are part of those who are going to be successful. How many times when we went to school, we never understood the importance and the significance of getting good marks. But the only reason why we got good marks was to impress our parents, to come back with a good report card. When we showed our, our children the report card, our parents a report card, and they said, MashaAllah, good boy, well done, bravo, so proud of you. We became really excited. Just imagine, that is not, we're not talking about our parents, or we're not talking about the prime minister, or the president, or the manager, etc. We're talking about Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and they are the successful ones. Allah ta'ala is saying, bravo. Allah ta'ala is saying, well done, you are lucky. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator, is telling us how many of us are depressed, how many of us feel that we are worthless, how many of us feel that we are nothing. Just imagine the creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is telling us how significant we are. Allah ta'ala is telling us how significant we are by saying, وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْفَلَحَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that they are part of those who are successful. Allah in another verse of the Quran says, Qada aflahal mu'minun. Just imagine you start off. We say what? We want to say thank you to the people of Slacks Creek and the people of Australia. Allah ta'ala starts off by saying, Qada aflahal mu'minun. Glad tidings to the believer. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to understand the significance. The significance of having iman. The significance of Having Iman, we don't realize the value of having Iman. You know, we have so many people in the world, they have money, they have position, they have status, they have good health, but ask them if they're happy. Ask them if they're happy. And I promise you the answer would be, what? They're not happy. They don't find happiness and they don't find contented. And that's what I want to speak about, inshallah, first before we go to the ibadat of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam and Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam. Happiness. We find that in a first world country and a third world country doesn't necessitate that the third world country will be sad and first world country means that we're all happy. It doesn't mean that a rich man, because he's rich, he's happy. And it doesn't mean that because you're a poor man, you're not happy. It doesn't mean that you've got a fast car, that you're happy, because ask those who have fast and really sophisticated cars, are they happy? So what's happiness? So in the West, they give a definition of what is happiness. They say, in the West, that the happiness is the aim just before reaching. The point just before you reach your aim that's happiness. The point just before reaching your aim, that's happiness. So they give an example. A man's running a race. And as he's running the race, he sees in front as he takes the corner, he sees the red ribbon. And he looks and he sees that everyone starts cheering. And he looks behind him and he sees that the runner-up, the person that comes after him, he's a distance away. So he becomes excited. He starts realizing, I'm the winner. I'm going to win. I'm going to win. And the people start to shout louder and they start whistling for him. And as he's about to cross the line, happiness comes to a peak that he's excited. But as soon as he crosses the line, happy, 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 happy. Gone. Gone. Finish. It's over. It's like a child just before Eid. Just before Eid, when we were small, me and Mulan Akram. We were excited before Eid. But as soon as Eid day came, there was so much excitement of thinking about it, it wasn't the same. So the West, I'm not talking about the Muslims, we're talking about the West. This is a definition from, from a Western source. They say that happiness is just before you, one reaches his aim. Can that be happiness? So you will see a person saying, once I buy my first house, I'm going to be very happy. Once I get married, I'm going to be very happy. Once I find my children a, a suitable spouse, I'm going to be happy. Once my kids grow up, 
I'm going to be happy. Once I'm going to, once I'm going to, once I'm going to, but it doesn't come. It doesn't come. And the biggest depression that people undergo in today's time is that because they had their hopes up, two elements creates depression. In my class as a, as a Darul Ulum teacher in South Africa, I have one psychiatrist in my classroom. And he tells me that there's two reasons why mankind then becomes depressed. Number one, he had false hope. False hope. Because the car, the house, the money, the life was based upon an aim of happiness. So when he gets to the point he realizes, uh oh, it was false hope. Number one. Number two, uh oh, I wasted time. Two years of my life, four years of my life, 10 years of my life, 20 years of my life, 30 years of my life, Ya Allah. 30 years of my life, I've been worrying about paying off this house, upon doing this and upon doing that. And when I thought, I thought, I thought that when I get there, I'll be happy. Two reasons why a person becomes depressed. So why build our life upon happiness, upon deception? So the Prophet ﷺ tells us that happiness is found in Iman. The Prophet ﷺ tells us that happiness, you're gonna find you want to find happiness? Find happiness in Iman. In the time of the Prophet, ﷺ, actually I'm wrong, in the time of Abu Bakr Siddiq, when he became the Khalifa, the first Khalifa of Islam, they had many enemies. The first enemy that they fought against after fighting those who became murtad was the Roman Empire. And the Prophet ﷺ, just before his demise, had an army prepared to fight against the Romans. But because of the political problems that they had within Medina itself, there was a battle just before this. Heraclius at that time was the Caesar of the Roman Empire. And one day he calls his commander into his chamber and he says, I want you, O commander, to do one favor for me. So the commander looks at the Caesar, Heraclius of that time, and he says that, O Caesar, whatever is your wish is my command. So Heraclius said that you are going to be fighting against the companions of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. I want you to bring back one ashab, one sahaba, one companion alive. So the commander looked at the king very confused, astonished and amazed. And he said to the king, Oh king, why would you want me to bring back one alive? So the king nodded his head and said, I am shamed that the commander of my army doesn't know the ahwal, the condition of his people. Don't you know the condition of your people? Don't you know that our youngsters have left the role models of Zeus and Hercules and those figures that we have been upholding as superpowers? They no longer see them as their heroes anymore. Our children now are making figurines and they are telling stories to each other and they have made their heroes, the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the like of Khalid bin Walid, Umar bin Khattab, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Uthman ibn Affan, and many of the Ashab. I want to prove our people wrong. I want to show our people that what these people are talking about is but a myth. This is what we call Chinese whispers. The, the, the news about him has just become bubbled up in society. So in the thickness of the battle, a particular sahaba, a sahaba by the name of Abu Talha is captured. And he's taken to the Roman Empire. And the Caesar at that time makes a banquet. And he invites the influential dignitaries and those who are famous. And he calls Abu Talha, and it's Abu Talha comes in shackles. And he says that, oh Abu Talha, if you leave your religion, the religion of Muhammad, I will give you every, half of what the Roman own will be your possession. And we all know at that time that three quarters of the dunya was under the leadership of the Roman Empire. Subhanallah. Abu Talha raises up his head and he looks towards the king. And he says, O oh Caesar, 
if you give me whatever the Roman Empire owns and possesses, and you give me whatever the Persians own, and you give me whatever the Arabs have accumulated, and you ask me to leave Deen for the blink of an eye, I will never leave my religion. The king became astonished, he became amazed, and most importantly, he became embarrassed. In front of the dignitaries, in front of important people, in front of his family, this is embarrassing. So the king gets up. He wants to show his power. He says, soldiers, take him, torture him until he basically renounces his deen. Only stop at the point when he renounces his deen. But they said as they tortured him, and they tortured him, only one thing came out of his mouth. Allah, 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 Torture after torture, torture after torture. Until the people could not witness anymore the embarrassment to see him bleeding the like in the state that he was in. People started to shout for mercy for him. The king became embarrassed that he felt that there was no more embarrassment for him. He says, take him and kill him. As they're dragging Abu Talha away, as they're dragging Abu Talha away, Fabuka and Shadid and Riwaya mentions that he starts to cry profusely. The king becomes happy. He says, see, I told you, for every person, there's a breaking point. Bring him back. They bring him back to the Caesar. And the Caesar says, if you tell the people, leave the religion, <coughs> leave your deen. I'm not asking you to leave your deen. Just tell the people that you are scared of death. So Abu Talha raised up his head. His body is wounded. He is oozing with blood. He looks at the king and says, oh king, I... I am crying at the moment, but I am not crying because my life is going to be taken, but I am crying because as soon as my life is taken, that is it. I wish that I had the life, like the amount of hair that I have on my body, so I can give every single life in a similar way for the sake of Allah. This was the sweetness of the Iman. This was the worthiness of the Iman. Nothing could compensate for that beautiful, that beautiful, beautiful Iman. And when Iman penetrated the heart, that was it. There was a man by the name of Sa'ad al-Aswad al-Sulami. The word Aswad means black in the Arabic language because he was a slave. And he was a slave that was set, by, set off by Abu Bakr al-Siddiq at the time. And he one day came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he says, O oh, Prophet of Allah, is there any place in Jannah for me? This is a slave coming. This is a slave, this is a slave that has been set free, and at that time they had no rank. Is there any place in Jannah for me, O Prophet of Allah? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looks at him and says, of course there's a place in Jannah for you. He says, but O Prophet of Allah, I, I'm not the like of Abu Bakr Siddiq, and I'm not the like of Umbi Khattab, and I'm not the like of Uthman ibn Affan, and I'm not the like of Khalid ibn Walid. I am just but a slave set free. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had this beautiful habit of smiling. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he, he smiled at him. And he says that, O Sa'ad, that if a person works on his iman and he builds that connection with Allah, there's a place in Jannah for everyone. He says, O Prophet of Allah, okay, then how come nobody wants to get their daughter married to me? <coughs> oh, we all say, Muslim brother, Muslim brother, just talk about someone's daughter. And you see how the, 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 the face changes. It usually happens with Australians, you know, I, I, I close with many Australians. They said, you know, when we became Muslim, everyone's saying, Takbir Allah, Akbar, Takbir, so loud. As soon as he heard about his daughter being involved, Allah, Akbar, inna lillahi wa inna lirajo. This is a scenario. <coughs> so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam smiled at him and said, O Sa'ad, go and propose to the daughter of Ibn Wahab. Now, who's Ibn Wahab? Ibn Wahab was one of the governors of Medina prior to the Islamic era. Very rich, a wealthy businessman, and most importantly, he was known for the most beautifulest girls in Medina. Where is the Prophet sending him to? To his house. So the Prophet sends him 
Sa'ad al-Aswad doesn't, he doesn't refuse. This slave starts walking to this massive house. And he knocks on the door. And when he knocks on the door, Abu, Abu, Ibn Wahab opens the door and he says, what do you want? And Sa'ad, the slave, says that, uh, that uh, the Prophet sent me to propose. He says, to you? Are you for real? <laughs> Which world are you living in? To you. Do you know who I am? Do you know my status? Have you not heard of my name in society in the business place? Have you seen my daughters? Have you seen them really? Have you seen them? You, my daughter, not happening. Huh? Khadi eight, get out. Go from here. Move. Shoo. Sadr Aswad Sulami he says, I became very heartbroken. I turned around and I listened and obeyed and I started to walk away. He says, as I started to walk away, I heard a beautiful, beautiful voice. The voice said, Sad, stop. Turn around, come back. He says, Wallahi, when I turned around and I saw this, this girl, he says, Wallahi, I've never seen such a more beautiful girl in my life. Not the beauty we're talking about in today's time. You know, outside is beauty, inside is biryani. Well, that's a different story. You know those ones, huh? Outside is very pretty, but inside is biryani. You know, one of my ustads, he always gives a story. I mean, maybe you heard it before. He says, you know, in Mullah Abdul Hamid, he says, one day, a man went to the mental, mental house. And he went to the doctor. He went to the doctor and they saw a man shouting, Shabnam! 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 Oh, Marf, my uncle's wife's name is Shabnam. Marf, sorry. Shabnam! Shabnam! So he said, hey, doctor, what's wrong with this man? Why is he shouting Shabnam? He says, don't you know this man? This man here cried for years, Layla Majnoon. He started crying for years for this girl, Shabnam. The father never allowed him. The father got, him, got her married to somebody else, but not to Shabnam. And now because of wanting Shabnam so much, he became mental. He is now in the hospital now. So he said, oh. They walk to the next, uh, next ward, and they see another man shouting, Shabnam, Shabnam, Shabnam. Said, hey, he also wants to get married to Shabnam. So no, he married Shabnam. He married Shabnam, and that's his condition now. So we're not talking about that beauty. We're talking about the beauty of Iman penetrating the heart. This is a slave boy. Ask your daughters in today's time to get married to a boy because he's a musalli, because he's a dhaki. He's a person that remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's a person that is close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A person that has good akhlaq and good manners. They say, no, he doesn't like Shah Rukh Khan. What's, what's going on? How? He doesn't look like Tom Cruise. It's a problem. How, what are my friends are going to say when they see me with that? They won't even see him. This is a problem. So she says, wait, come here. She turns to her father. She says to her father, oh my father, where would we be today without the Prophet of Allah? Where would we be today without Islam and Iman? Where were we before? What was our hawal? What was our condition? What was our condition before this? Meaning, يعني, we weren't happy and now how happy we are because of Iman. Oh, Sa'ad, go to the Prophet of Allah. Tell the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that I accept. Sa'ad al-Aswad Sulami, he doesn't walk, this guy is skipping. He comes to the Prophet of Allah out of breath, he tells the Prophet of Allah, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they accept it. Kabul. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam smiles at him, says, go to Uthman ibn Affan and get some money from him. He goes to Uthman ibn Affan, he comes back with 600 dirhams. Sa'ad is holding it up like this. And as he's carrying it and bringing it to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, the oh, Prophet of Allah, 600 dirhams, I've never had so much money in my hand before. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looks at him and he smiles. He says, oh, Prophet, he says, oh Sa'ad, go to your house and spend your time with your wife. The Prophet sallallahu gets him married. And as this slave boy is now making his way to the, to the house, he's nervous. He's nervous. He realizes, I'm going to the house of a beautiful girl. Not any beauty, the most beautiful in Medina. How can I come empty-handed? Let me go to the marketplace and buy something for my beloved daughter, my, my beloved wife. When he goes into the marketplace, one of the horsemen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala announces the expedition. He thinks to himself for that moment, what does Allah want from me now? So instead of buying a present, he buys a burda 
and he buys artillery and he makes his way to the battlefield. One of the Ashab asks Ali bin Abi Talib as the Riwayah mentions that who's the man that is covering his face? Ali bin Abi Talib says, don't worry about who the person is. If he has the same sincere desire of coming close to Allah, then let him be. In the thickness of the battle, he is taken off his horse and he lands and the Riwayah says that his arm becomes exposed. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Saad, is that you? Saad, is that you? Saad, is that you? Saad al-Aswad al-Sulami removes his mask and says, O Prophet of Allah, it was I. I was worried, O Prophet of Allah, if you saw me, you would never allow me to come. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, I only knew because Jibreel alayhi salatu wa sallam came to me. And Jibreel alayhi salatu wa sallam said that Allah is saying that there is a place in Jannah for you. He says, why wait? In the thickness of the battle, the, the announcement is made that Saad al-Aswad al-Sulami has passed away. Saad al-Aswad al-Sulami has passed away. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam starts to look for the body of Saad. He finds the body of Saad. He takes the head of Saad. He places the head of Saad onto his lap. Fabuka al shadid and he starts to cry. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam starts to cry. And when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam starts to cry, after a while the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam smiles and then he looks away. Waqi' ibn Jarrah radiallahu anhu narrates this particular part of the narration and he says that we asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam what happened? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says when he cried I felt the sweetness in my heart that someone understood the reality and purpose of his life and that he's close, coming close to Allah. And then I saw the angels take him up to the well of Kothar and he was drinking from the well of Kothar. And then I saw the Hurrains come for him, so I looked away. When Iman penetrates the heart, my respected brothers, then nothing can compensate. But now, how do we increase in Iman? In today's time, when we talk about Deen, Islam, what do we hear after that? Terrorism. When we hear about Islam, we hear about fighting, hatred, enmity. Now remember the purpose of getting Iman is to find happiness. The Prophet ﷺ tells us how to perfect Iman. Not by fighting, not by hating, not by jealousy, and not by enmity. The Prophet ﷺ says, أَكْمَلُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِيمَانًا أَحْسَنُهُمْ خُلُقًا The Prophet ﷺ says, the most completed and perfected of believers is the person that has perfected one's mannerism. In perfecting one's mannerism, one has perfected iman, therefore perfected happiness. If we want to be happy, then perfect our iman. And if we want to perfect our iman, then have good conduct. Imam Ghazali in his book, Bidaya wa Nihaya, mentions what is good manners, what is akhlaq. He says, first of all, can you see akhlaq? You know, sometimes we meet someone, what do we say? <coughs> mashallah, salam alaikum, khirit. Mashallah, 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 alhamdulillah. As soon as he walks, huh? Salah, shaitan, iblis. Huh? We love that, huh? We love to sit together. We love to sit together and we start to gossip. As if we are, we are giving off what is akhlaq manners. We say this man is good and this man is not good. So Imam Ghazali gives an example. He says, you have this meadow and there's this tall grass and a man comes and starts to walk in this grass. What does he leave behind? So Imam Ghazali says, very simple, he leaves footprints. Because the grass bends where he walks and all of a sudden we have a footprint. Can a second man come and say, I can see a man? No, he can say, I can see the traces of a man, but he can't say, I can see a man. He says, similarly is akhlaq. You can't see until you open up the heart of that person and only then can you see iman. Only then can you see akhlaq. He gives another example. In Australia, it's very easy to explain. We all know what tree loppers is, isn't it? Plenty of tree loppers. We have a couple here. <coughs> tree loppers, yes? When a tree lopper goes to a person's house, he asks them, why do you want to cut the tree down? 
So most commonly that person says the reason why I want to cut the tree is because the tree is dead. So a tree lopper will tell you that you cannot tell whether the tree is dead by looking at the outer, but rather if you break the tree or the bark open and if there's moisture inside, then the tree was alive. How many of us have ever cut the heart of our Muslim brother to actually see whether he had akhlaq or not? So when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, أَكْمَلُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِيمَانًا أَحْسَنُهُمْ خُلُقًا That the most perfected of believers is he who perfects his conduct, his good akhlaq, his manners. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was giving us a measurement that we can only use for ourselves. We cannot see the mannerism of the next person. We waste our life and our time looking at the akhlaq and the mannerism of others when we cannot see the mannerism of others. Now, let's carry on. What does it mean now to have mannerism? There's a famous surah in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given virtues in reciting this surah. What surah is that? Can anyone tell me? Surah that is virtuous, that there's so much thawab, so much reward of reading this surah, not ayah, Surah in the beginning and the end of the day. Uncle Malik? Aviz <laughs> Umar? What surah? Don't be humble now. <laughs> Anybody? What surah? That it is so virtuous to read it in the morning and in the evening. Me. Ah, who's that? Moment. He knows. Everyone say, MashaAllah. <laughs> Barakallah feekum. That is right. Surah Mulk. Surah Mulk, the virtues of Surah Mulk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, hadith upon hadith that speaks about how beautiful, how beautiful is to read Surah Mulk and the reward and the thawab is, 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 is unimaginable. But what is the understanding? What is the tafsir of Surah Mulk? We are only going to be talking about the first couple of ayats. What does Allah say? A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. تَبَارَكَ الَّذِي بِيَدِهِ الْمُلْكُ وَهُوَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا أيكم أحسن عملا وهو العزيز الغفور تبارك الذي blessed is Allah blessed is He بيده الملك in Allah's hand is the domain وهو على كل شيء قدير and upon all things Allah is all capable ابن كثير رحم الله ابن عباس رضي الله تعالى says what? What does Allah Ta'ala address in such a way? How many of us ever go for holiday? <coughs> and when we go for holiday, we're worried about our house. What's going to happen to our house? Who's going to look after our house? What will the condition of my house be? How many of us when we leave our family, then we're worried about the well-being of our family? If I die, who's going to provide for my family? Allah Ta'ala is saying, I'm sorted out. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, I'm sorted. I don't need بيده الملك. I have the upper hand. بيده الملك. In my hand is the domain. وهو على كل شيء قدير. And I have all ability. So these stepping stones that you have, these aims that you have, these accomplishments that you have, this responsibility that you have given, yes, they are responsibilities, but only stepping stones. Allah reminds mankind that that's not the purpose. Allah Taala says. الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاتَ Allah Ta'ala says, Allah is that Allah that created death and life for one purpose. One purpose. لِيَبَلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا To test you, to test you, to see which one of you is going to do the best of manners, best of, best of deeds. Now let's look at these words. Best of deeds. In the Arabic language, every word falls under three root letters. 
And when those three root letters are placed on a particular type of scale, it gives a meaning. So the word sajada means to prostrate. So when I say sajada, it means he one man prostrated. I add a ya in the beginning of sajada, yes judu, it becomes he one man is praying or will pray. If I add an alif in the beginning, usjud, I'm commanding prostrate. If I put it on the scale of fa'il, sajid, it's a person who is a prostrator. If I use it on the word with a meme in the beginning, it becomes masjid. And masjid means a place of making sajda. So the word ahsanu, its root letter words is hasana. Its root letter words is hasana. And it has been placed on the scale of af'al. Which means ahsan. Anything that is put on the scale of af'al means better. So if I say jameel, what does jameel mean? Everyone knows. Now let's put it on the scale of af'al. Ajmal, what does that mean? Most beautiful. I'll give you a nicer one. Ikram means what? What does ikram mean? Huh? Generosity. Let's put it on the scale of af'al. Whose name it becomes? Imam Akram. So, what does Akram mean? Better than Ikram. <laughs> Akram means better than Ikram. That's exactly what it means. It means that he's more deserving, more better in being what? Hospitable. Hospitable. So, Allah Ta'ala says, which one of you is going to do the best of deeds? But why does Allah say that? Why doesn't Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala just say, Husnul Amala? Husnul Amla means good deeds. Allah Ta'ala could have said, to test you, which one of you is going to do a good deed? Wasn't that our purpose of doing good deeds? But Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is telling us, no, not any type of Amal, not any type of good deed, Ahsanul Amala, the best of good deeds. The question now is, what is the best of good deeds? What's the best of good deeds? So I'll give you an example. <clears throat> if I build a house, before building a house, what should I put first? Foundation. What's more important, the structure or the foundation? Any day. If the foundation is weak, the house is weak. Agreed? But what's the purpose of the foundation? What's the purpose of the foundation? The house. To build a house. To build a structure. So if a person stays with the foundation, is it any benefit? Even though it's important. I'll give you another example. A man goes into pick and pay. Oh, uh, sorry. A man goes into... Uh, Woolworths. Woolworths. That's too long. Cape Town. Sorry. Right? <laughs> right? A person goes into Woolworths. Woolworths or Coles. And he buys some goods. And when he comes to the teller, he has a right upon the lady behind the tiller. And the lady behind the tiller has a right upon him. He must give the money and she must give the goods. She must give position to him. So sometimes when you buy clothes, it has a tag to it. So when you pay the money, the tag is taken off. If the tag is not taken off, then what happens? Bzzz. Beep, 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 beep. Yes? In South Africa, it's only beep, 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 beep. You have two, three security jumping on you. <coughs> beep, beep is not good enough. The guy runs. Beep, beep starts laughing. It's just beep, 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 beep. <coughs> so it's beep, 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 and then the security jump on you too. Does the security have a right to jump on you? Yes, because you didn't pay the money. You did not fulfill the right of the teller. And because you haven't fulfilled the right of a teller, they can jump on you. Am I correct? Let's look at another scenario. You pay the money, you pay the money, the lady behind the teller starts to smile at you. And she says, G'day mate, how's it going? Or like in South Africa, they say what? Ukhandat? Fufa? Or the Urdu, they say what? Khairit say? Or in, Afri or in Arabic, they say what? Kifhal? Bi khair? And I decide to have a sour face. I decide not to smile. I decide not to greet back. I decide not to respond. 
Can we have someone say, uh, we have in aisle 9 another guy not smiling, can you please jump on him? Can you? Can we have someone say, in aisle 9 security, please take this guy down, he's not smiling. Can we? <laughs> but are they both good qualities? The difference is, one is rights and one is a courteous deed. One is rights, and one is a courteous deed. As the foundation, we said, is important. أَقِمُ الصَّلَاةِ وَآتُ الزَّكَاةِ وَصَوْمُ رَمَضَانِ وَالْحَجُّ الْبَيْتِ مَنِ اسْتَطَعْ إِلَيْهِ السَّبِيلَةِ To perform our salah, to pay our, 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 our obligatory charity, to fast in the month of Ramadan, to perform hajj, these are all rights. But is that enough? The scholars of deen mention, when Allah Ta'ala says, أَحْسَنُ amala," Allah is not speaking about rights. We have to pray. We have to fast. We have to fulfill this amal. The amal that we're going to do now is slaughter a sheep. But slaughtering the sheep is not good enough. Slaughtering the sheep is not good enough. We speak about the hadith after hadith that talks about the blood doesn't reach. But what reaches? What reaches? Taqwa. Iman. What is iman? Good akhlaq, good manners. What is good ma? Good iman. What is good akhlaq? To be courteous. To be courteous. These amal of salah and fasting and zakat is only for us to get good manners. Is only for us to start become courteous with others. To start being caring with others. To start building compassion and love. Like the Prophet wasallam had in his life. Love and compassion. Ayyukum ahsanu amala. Which one of you is going to do? Not the rights. The rights you have to do. Which one of you is going to do the best of amal? And what amal is that? Being courteous with the next person. Now the question is, what does it mean to be courteous? Now the question is, what does it mean to be courteous? So the ulama kira mentioned that being courteous is a person that never judges. In Arabic they call it qaydun kharaja bihi. Abstracting a person being courteous, a person being judgmental, but a person being understanding. How many of us judge others? How many of us, when we look at others, we judge others? The scholars of Deen mention, the scholars of Deen mention that a courteous act is what? An action that is without being judgmental, but understanding. How many of our youngsters, my respected brothers and elders, this is a very important topic. This is something which is important. The brothers are going to help in the kitchen, inshallah. Let's bear with me, we nearly finish. How many of our youth are suffering in this country? How many youngsters are in marriages that don't want to be in, but because of peer pressure, they're worried about being judged in society. They stay in the marriage. They stay in that home. They only do things because of what people are going to think about them. How will they be judged in their society? As an Aussie born scholar, someone that grew up in this country, grew up with Australians. In fact, my brother and me, I was just telling the brothers yesterday, our nickname in Perth was Fiji Brothers. Because they've never seen a Fijian before. They've never seen a Fijian before. In Perth, we were very few. So at school, they would call us Fiji. Because we were a rare breed. Uh, we like, were like the rhinos. Did you become instinct in Perth? Is my brothers with me? How many are the youth being judged in today's time? We ask ourselves, why aren't the masajid filled with youth? Why are the youth not coming to our elders? I'll give you a scenario. Papa, I want to get married. First, oh, why do you want to get married? You're so young. That why has no answer to it. The mother doesn't want to, or the father doesn't want to hear the reason. The father says, oh, I brought up my son better than this. What is he? He's asking to get married. Let's take it one step further. Okay, the father says, okay, get married. Who's the person from? Huh? Johannesburg, Pakistan, Fiji, Australia. Allah. Uh, what? Where from where? No, you mean Australian, Fiji, no? Australian, Pakistan. No, 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 no. Why is Australian? Oh, what am I going to tell my family back home in the street, back in the country? Are oh, we going to be embarrassed? 
What will they all think about us? Ya Allah, what will our condition be like? We ask, what are we doing? Wallahi in sharia, as a scholar that teaches Daru Ulub, legal theory, usul fiqh, I tell you, there is no place in sharia that allows one person to judge the other. The scholars of deen mentioned, Imam Nawi rahimahullah says, even a qadi, a judge, can't judge. Even the qadi who is a judge can't judge. All he's doing is calculating what Allah Ta'ala wants and he's passing that. But he's not judging. According to the rules of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, the judgment is made. But he's not judging. What is our dilemma in today's time? We are praying salah. We are fasting. We are slaughtering sheep. We are doing all these beautiful actions. But these beautiful actions, my respected brothers and elders, Ayyukum ahsanu amala is to lead to the point which one of us is going to understand the reality of these ibadat and that is to become courteous and understanding with others. We see a brother with no beard, we look down at him. We see a brother with a big beard these days, we look down at him. We see a person that smells like alcohol, we belittle him. When are we going to start understanding? When are we going to start understanding? If a brother comes in the mosque and he's stingy like wine, we're going to say, subhanallah, what a beautiful person. Hamza Yusuf in one clip, Hamza Yusuf in one clip, he gives a very beautiful, beautiful, beautiful story. He says, I was sitting in first class in Emirates. And as I was flying, as I was flying, there was a lady and her name was Aisha. And she wore a mini dress and she dressed just like the air hostess dress. But she came to me and said, when I serve wine, I serve it with my left hand. And Hamza Yusuf started crying. Hamza Yusuf started crying. He says, that's Iman. How many of us would start criticizing, belittling, mocking, degrading? How many of us will say, Astaghfirullah, Aisha, and look how she's dressed. Allah gives Iman. Allah gives hidayah. It's our job. Ayyukum, 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 ahsanu amala. Which one of you is going to do the best of deeds? And that is how to become courteous with each other. How are we going to understand each other? When are we going to stop judging each other and destroying our youngsters? We have youth in today's time. You know, they, they, they made, a, they, they made a, a, a discovery. They said that in Canada, America, and Australia are breeding grounds for what? Extremeness. And they ask, why? Why countries where a roof over their head, food in their belly, you sort it out? You know, in South Africa, we don't follow the rules on the, on the road. I came back to Australia. I have to really watch the, 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 the speedometer because 60, you know, just to go over 70, yeah, Allah, so easy. My leg is so heavy. Because in South Africa, if there's no space, then we, we make a space. <laughs> That's how we drive. So coming back here, there's so much rules. But do you know? that the country that has the most road kills is Australia still. Yeah. The country that the, has the highest rate of road kills is still Australia. We have abuses of alcohol in this country. We have people that are extreme when it comes to alcohol. We have people that is extreme when it comes to drugs. We have people that are not only in regards to Islamophobia, and this is what I said to one of the officials. It's not Islamophobia, it's everything phobia. Drugs is phobia. Alcohol is phobia. Why? But why is our Muslim youth founding themselves in this scenario? I'll give you an example. The man, this youngster goes at home, and when he goes home, the father says, why can't you be like the other, other Pakistanis? Why can't you be like the other Turkish? Why can't you be like this and why can't you be like that? When they go to school, then the school tells them, you're not from here, not from Australia. What are they missing? ID. Any person that doesn't have identification, what else is left to live? And these extremist group, what do they do? They give them ID. You are a brother in Islam. You are someone great in our eyes. You are noble in our eyes. Huh? So when we bring the qualities back of a ahsan al-amala, when we bring the qualities of ahsan al-amala back into our lives, that we don't judge people, we understand people. We look at the beautiful face of the person and says, MashaAllah, how beautiful is he? We look at our, our, our Muslim sister and say, how beautiful is she? And when they come to us with problems, we have a youth in today's time, not only here but in South Africa, 
we're suffering from a problem of homosexuality. But scholars are saying haram, haram. They know it's haram. You don't need a verdict for that. You don't need a fatwa for that. You don't need a fatwa for that. We need understanding. Papa, I want to become, I want to become a poet. La ilaha illallah. I want to become a medical doctor. He wants to become a poet. Understand. Say, mashallah, my boy. Alhamdulillah, my son. You have my full support. You will see, say, Papa, uh, two weeks later, Jazakallah, Papa, um, I'm a medical doctor. Alhamdulillah. Why? Because we didn't, we didn't judge our youngsters. We understood our youngsters. When we start to understand each other, and that's what scholarship is about. In Islam, there's not one right way. There are many right ways. There are many right ways. Why? Because Islam is showing us what? Brotherhood. Islam is showing us unity. How? If Allah Ta'ala wanted to create us individually, we could have been created individually, but Allah created us as a unit, as a family. Allah has created such a way that we rely on each other because Allah is looking for لِيَبَلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا To test you, which one of you is going to do courteous actions? Which one of you is going to do the best of actions? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us understanding. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to appreciate our youngsters, to connect with our youngsters, to realize that this is Australia. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed test upon us here in Australia. And in order for us to make a difference, the first difference is, ayyukum ahsanu amala. Which one of us is going to do the best of deeds by being courteous and understanding with the next Muslim brother or the next non-Muslim brother and sister? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us as one. I'm so sorry for taking too much of your time. Wa akhiru da'awana. And alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.